We are reading from Titus 3, verse 1 to 15. Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his spirits on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with a hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have, sorry, those who have believed in God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, and disputes about the law, because they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a divisive person after the first and second warning, for you know that such a person has gone astray and is sinning. He is self-condemning. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me in Nic Nicopolis, because I have decided to spend the winter here. Diligently help Zenas, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey so that they will lack nothing. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works for pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. All those who are with me send you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with all of you. This is the word of the Lord. There's a page on Wikipedia that's called The Criticism of Christianity. Don't know if you guys have ever seen it. Lots of sections, lots of content on the page. Massive section on Scripture and the Bible. How can you believe that it's true? It's such an old story. It was written by so many people. How can you believe in miracles? How can you believe in Jesus' resurrection? Blah, blah, blah. And then there's also intellectual arguments about faith and what faith means to one another. Huge section on the page. And then there's a section on the page called Criticism of Historical Behavior. And in that section, there's information and discourse on colonialism, slavery, Christianity and women, Christianity and violence, Christianity and science, and in that section, the main content is all the isms and phobias that Christians are known for. It's a hard section to read, I have to be honest, because this criticism comes from the lives of Christians. This criticism comes from their behavior. How we live our everyday lives in the public space matters. We carry a badge, brothers and sisters. That badge is called ambassador, which means that we operate on behalf of someone else and we act according to their values, identity, and ethics. I heard a discouraging story this week on a podcast of a guy who works in a retail store. And in that retail store, he asked someone else who works with him, why don't you believe in Jesus? Or why don't you believe in Christianity? And the guy said, have you ever re realized or recognized who treats us the most poorly in the store? The Christians. And then the guy said, well, I think that's a little bit rough. And then he said, it's not. Open your eyes to Sunday mornings after 10 o'clock. 
and see what happens in this store once the Christians arrive. And the guy told the story of the store manager on the internal radio saying, brace yourselves, the Christians will be released from church soon. It's 10 o'clock. That is a very, very discouraging story. This is the season finale of our series called Transforming Culture. Thank you for everyone's feedback about the series so far, and thank you for all the engagement with the series. I have to be honest that in the beginning of the series, because I preached many of the sermons, I didn't feel like anyone was listening. I would look up and I would see at least four to five people sleep, and I would think, I don't know if anyone is paying attention. But then I get WhatsApps through the week and calls, and we have conversations, and people say, dude, this series is turning out to be a beaut. So thank you for the feedback. I appreciate that. I've been working in ministry for 15 years, and I've never preached through this book. So it's a great journey for me as well. We're working through Paul's letter to Titus, we know that, and we've been asking two questions as we go. How can we wisely participate in culture in order to transform it for the common good? And we've also asked the question, how can our church, uh, sorry, how can our lives make the teaching about God our Savior, the teaching about the gospel attractive? In the beginning of the series, we said that the church should be an agent of transformation, and we said it's not through culture wars, or through assimilation to culture, either fighting with culture or being like culture, but rather through wise participation in culture. Let me just give you the Bible Project visual, because it seems like that's what we are doing during this series. The print might be small, but it's just a visual layout of chapter 3 that Marie just read. Marie's my wife, by the way. As she came down the stairs, she gave me a little graze on my leg here. And I was thinking, if you guys saw that and you did not know that she was my wife, it might look funny. But she is my wife. It's 100% legit. So thank you, love. Um, uh, so this is a layout of the chapter. And you'll see up top, the basic premise of verse 1 to 3 is Christians should be ideal citizens. And then you see them being friendly, serving people, and working for the common good. And then there's a huge section that's all about the gospel. That's really important. We'll get back to that. And then you'll see down here, it says, Spirit-empowered faithfulness to Jesus will declare God's grace to the world. That's where we're going to land at the end. And then there's a closing to this letter because it is a letter that was written to someone. And we'll get there as well. One question, how are we an agent of transformation? And there's your three points. Be new humans and great citizens. That's verses 1 to 3. Be gospel-centered. That's verses 4 to 7. And be unified by loving and serving one another. That's where we are going today. That's our map. Interesting fact, good works gets mentioned six times in Titus. But it always gets mentioned with a gospel proclamation right next to it. That is brilliant. So you'll hear a lot of we should, we should, we should this morning, but it's never divorced of the gospel and God's grace. Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump right in. Lord Jesus, as we open up your word now, we pray that you would speak to us, that you would shape us into your image, that you would correct us, that, uh, if we need correction, that you would strengthen us and encourage us, that you would remind us, that you would give us great hope, and that you will inspire us through your Holy Spirit to live according to your will. We think about these criticisms that we just heard. We think about the many times that we've heard people. And Lord Jesus, we know that that is not what you called us for. And therefore, we pray now that your word would be life-giving to us this morning as we preach it. Give us great attention, help us to focus, help me to speak the truth and only the truth, and may your name be glorified through the reading and the preaching of your word this morning. I pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, so let's just get a point of departure before we launch into these three points. Remember question of the day. Something happened to you and it changed your story. The gospel and believing the gospel Coming to faith, getting saved, submitting your life to Jesus should have the same effect than all the other events that you spoke about this morning. The gospel and believing in it is a truly life-altering 
moment. So here's the big point that I want to make, and then we'll look at the three points that I just mentioned. Regeneration, or rebirth, regeneration is a big word, but we'll see it in verse 5, radically changes us. It changes us inside and out, and it changes us in such a way that we now reflect the gospel change to one another, those in the church, and to the watching world, those outside the church. It's a life-changing moment. Now, the teaching text starts by speaking about those outside the church. And the first three verses is all about being new humans and great citizens. So, let me show you the verses. Once again, as always, the bold and underlined emphasis is what I inserted there for us to focus on because it will help us to see what this text is all about. Submit, obey, and be ready. Those are the th first three uh, words we need to look at. This is how we are new humans. This is how we are great citizens. Those words are in the present tense, which means that it is a continuous state. What do Christians do to the outside world and to people they engage with and to the culture? We submit, we obey, and we are ready. Now, if you say submit and obey in the world we currently live in, it might sound like a defeatist posture. Like, oh, I can't do anything, so I'll just submit and obey. But that's actually not what Paul is talking about here. Paul is talking about an active posture. A posture in which you actually do something. And a posture seeking the well-being and good order of society. Let's get personal. Paying your taxes. Obeying the rules of the road. Helping people in need. Getting involved in your community for the common good. We get confronted with this every single day. This is the kind of stuff that Paul talks about. If he says that we submit and we obey, and we are ready to do good works. And I would like to submit it to you that if Paul was here today, and he would hear us speak about these things, he would tell us that obedience is a gospel issue. Here's what I mean. Let's talk about paying your taxes. It's easy to say, have you seen the widespread corruption and waste of money in our country? Look what they do with our tax money. Paul would go, okay. Think about obeying the rules of the road. Everyone drives the way they want to anyway. Everyone is disobedient. I'm going to be the only guy trying to obey the rules of the road. Why should I care? Think about helping people in need. They've got their problems. I've got mine. Their problems are not mine. Someone else is supposed to look after them. And then often we lay it at the door of our government and our leaders. If they didn't waste all the money I paid in taxes, then they would be able to help those people. Someone else should do something about it. Getting involved in our communities. I didn't cause that problem. I'm not going to fix it. Or what's the use in trying to fix it? Because we'll get no help. We'll get no funding. We won't have any maintenance on our infrastructure. It's a lost cause. I'll just, might just as well immigrate to Canada. That's how people talk. So it's easy to think of these things and go, yeah, 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 like right now, I hear you, submit and obey, but I'm not on for this. If Paul was here, he would say that you can't choose when to be obedient to Jesus and when not. And therefore you can't choose when to submit and to be obedient to the authorities over you. Because if you are able to choose when to be obedient and when not, what's the chances of you not doing that in your own relationship with Jesus? So obedience and submission and being ready for good works is not about the other. It is a gospel issue. It's about what sits in our heart. Are we always, in everything, obedient to Jesus? And if that answer is yes, 
Then Paul says, one of the ways in which you are a new human and you are a great citizen is submit and obey to the authorities over you, do what needs to be done for the common good, and be ready to kick into gear and to help. Because if we do this without moaning, without groaning, or without trying to find ways to bypass these things, we show how different we are. Think about this. You are standing around the braai with amagents, and this guy says, I will not pay my taxes because, and he gives you 15 reasons. And I say, I pay my taxes because Jesus expects it from me. There's your witness. There's no judgment or condemnation in what he does. I'm just saying that that is what Jesus wants of me. Because if I do pay my taxes, I am contributing towards the common good. If I do drive according to the speed limit, I do contribute towards the common good. If we strap our kids in, we do contribute towards the common good. And I don't need any other reason than this is what Jesus expects of me. We need to sit with this. Because we've got clever ways in bypassing obedience. And once again, I want to ask you, and I'm asking, that my, uh, I'm asking that question myself, if I've got clever ways in bypassing obedience to others, how can I not have clever ways in bypassing obedience to Jesus? There should be a consistency there. Let me just take a sidebar quickly. Eh? Are there ever, is there, is there ever a time to be disobedient? And to not submit to the authorities. And to not obey the authorities. There is a time. Let me show you. Acts chapter 5. The apostles in front of the Jewish council. They were authorities at that time. Verses 27 to 29. After they brought them in, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin. That's the Jewish council. And the high priest asked, Didn't we strictly order you not to? To teach in, his, uh, in this name. Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than people. So there is a time to be disobedient. There is a time not to submit. But that is when the authorities over us asks us to be disobedient to God. Paying your taxes is not being disobedient to God, guys. Driving like a sensible human being is not being disobedient to God. We should be able to differentiate between these things. Why? Because then we will be new humans and great citizens that actually transform culture. Let's keep going. Look at some other emphases I added. I think that's the right plural, is it? Emphasis, emphasis, emphases, emphasis, I don't know. But let's look at the rest. Uh, slander, slander no one, avoid fighting. And this is specifically now about people in the public space. And in Titus, he's referring to the leaders of their time. How do we talk about other people? And what do we say about them? What kind of jokes do we forward on WhatsApp? What kind of funny stuff do we send on family groups that we think is funny, but it's actually not at all? It's slander. It shouldn't be expected of us. Never. If we want to criticize and speak truth to power, then you do it in love. You don't do it by using words of slander. Think of fighting. Oh my word. Post something on the socials. Make yourself some popcorn and sit back and see how people just hammer whoever they want to hammer on the socials. We've got the spirit of fighting in our world. I don't care if it's in our world. It shouldn't be in here. But sometimes it does creep in. Like our base position is fighting and conflict and arguing. To be kind. Always showing gentleness. And look at this word. To all people. How do you cue? How do you cue? Anyone? Are you a good cueer? I'm a really nice guy, but whoo, 
I queue bad. I, there's just something that happens to me in a queue that the Spirit of God needs to change inside of me. But it's a good question. Like, how do you queue? How do you react to service? If you just received service from someone, whether it is over the telephone, customer query, or in uh, wherever you were queuing, and we would do a quick informal interview with that person, what do you think about the person you just served? Will they say, that person was so kind and so gentle to me? Or will they not? I think it's a worthy question. And then once again, do you see the word all people? All means all. That all means everyone. Always. That's how we are called to live. Now the stuff I mentioned now, friends and family, brothers and sisters, that is what the people in the project management space call low-hanging fruit. It's a quick win. It's not rocket science to do what the first two verses tell us to do. So we need to sit and reflect on this, and we need to think of the potential if we grab these opportunities. Imagine if you would see every person and every interaction every single day as a way in which you can make a positive difference. Not just someone or something or a moment that you need to get what you want. Let's look at verse 3. Here's what Paul says. He says, this is your old self. He describes Christians in the past tense. Now, I don't know about you, but foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved, malice, envy, hateful, and detesting, that doesn't sound like the good life. But that's the life that we all lived before we came to faith, before the Spirit entered us, and before the Spirit changed us. And even though it is part of our old self, every now and then it does pop up. I don't know about you, but sometimes something would happen to me, and I would show a character trait of old Reino back in the day. And I'm like... My word, where did you come from? You shall not live here. Get behind me. That's important for us. When these things pop up, we need to remember that this is who we were. It is not who we are. But if you look at some of these characteristics, foolish, disobedient, deceived, especially enslaved and various passions and pleasures, malice and envy, sometimes in our world, these things are celebrated in our culture. Speaking poorly of someone is called free speech. Being enslaved by something and enjoying it as much as you want is called me being me and you being you and me being free. But you're actually not free at all. And that's why Paul reminds them that this is who they were. They didn't know how to live. They were not obedient. They believed falsehood, which is being deceived. They were enslaved. And then they hurt each other in a really, really bad way through malice. Oh, sorry, not malice, malice, envy, uh, being hateful and detesting one another. How do we transform culture? How are we an agent of transformation? We are new humans and great citizens. Now, can I be a new human? Or can I not? Is it possible for me to achieve these things? It absolutely is. Why? Well, let's look at the gospel. Verses 4 to 7. So, just look at the highlights quickly. Kindness. Love. Saved us. According to His mercy. Abundantly. Justified. Is. Amongst other things. This is the main focus. For us to live as new humans and to live as great citizens, we have to start here. This is critical for our lives as Christians. Think about this real quick. Think of all the have-tos in everyday life. When I wake up in the morning, I have to use the bathroom. And I have to eat food. And I have to brush my teeth or at least cleanse myself in some way. 
and I have to put on clothes. <laughs> Let's be honest, the pastoral visit won't go that well if I don't. Those are essentials to my life. There's also a whole lot of other things that I have to do in a day, but if I don't do those, I cannot love. If we don't believe in this, if we don't live in this reality, if we don't start every day here as followers of Jesus, we will not be able to do it. We have to start here every day. So Paul moves from who we were to who we are. He speaks of us in the present state. Think about this, if we play with words. God could have left us in verse 3, but He didn't. And that's great news to all of us. He appeared. Do you see the personification? It was a human being that showed us God, and that human being is Jesus. And when He appeared, He was full of mercy and kindness and love. And when He appeared, He didn't only show His character, He also did something to us regeneration, I'll get to that word now, and renewal, really, really important. God didn't pitch and then punished and killed. That's so important for us to understand. When God appeared, He didn't appear to say, you are furnished. Do you remember those old school TV games where you would punch, 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 and then the person's power would go down until it's red, and then He would stand there kind of reeling, and then the TV game says, finish him and then you go for the raid and boop 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 kick down here anybody uh, well i just gave away my age i am indeed very old anyhow when god appeared he regenerated he renewed he justified us cleared the record said not guilty made us right and then gave us that beautiful title is we have something really good waiting for us. Hear this, church, this morning. The gospel is not about making good men better. It's not about making bad people good. It's about bringing dead people to life. And you are either dead or you are alive. There's no in-between. And we have the opportunity and the invitation to choose this life because of this whole vibe that God did for us. Do you guys see it? So Paul says, be new humans and be great citizens and be gospel-centered. Because if this is the essentials to your life, you will be able to get it right. Why? Because God does a great work in us. Let's talk about that great work quickly. The word regeneration means our entire nature is changed. It's an English word made up of an English presupposition or a prefix and a Greek word that's transliterated into English, regenesis. It means to start again, but different this time. This word, regeneration, in the Greek New Testament only gets used twice. Once here, and once in Matthew 19. And in Matthew 19, it's Jesus speaking, and He uses this word, and He uses this word by saying that everything you see will be made new, and it will have a whole new nature. Jesus talks about a whole cosmos. And now Paul says, this is what Jesus did inside of you. Do you guys remember? Simba. Lion King, hanging out with Timon and Pumbaa. And now all of a sudden he can't chow meat anymore. He has to chow bugs. Slimy yet satisfying. Do you guys remember that? He's still a lion, but his nature changes in the story from a meat eater to a bug eater. It's weird, but that's the idea that Paul has here is that when you're regenerated, your whole nature changes. So Simba is still a lion, but now he chows bugs. Can you imagine if that was in real life? Whew, that would be weird. Huh? Think of a nice big Maasai Mara male lion chowing some shrubs and grass. That would look really funny because we would go, but this is different than how a lion usually acts. And Paul would say, exactly. His nature was changed. He started over, and He is different now. Guys, this is what the gospel does to us. And it's great news. Sidebar. 
I don't know about you, but oftentimes when I share the gospel and I talk to people about the cost of following Jesus and the things that we have to leave behind, because remember, it works like this, you turn away from something and you turn towards something. And often people say to me, I don't know if I can turn away from these things. Do you know what you say to them? No, you can't. But the Holy Spirit inside of you will help you to do it. So yes, you can, because He does it in you. It's really important for us. And He does a great work of regeneration and renewal through His Holy Spirit. Just another side note, I've made three now. This is a phenomenal passage. If you ever want to share the gospel with someone, to go, you know what, let's just read three verses together, because it's all in here. And if you keep your eyes open, you'll see the Trinity in here as well. Do you guys see it? God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, all at work in this great act of salvation. This is a phenomenal piece of Scripture. I need to keep going. So Once again, we receive this. I said this last night at the carols. Let me say it again. You couldn't get yourself born. You were born. It was done to you, for you. In exactly the same way, you can't get yourself reborn. It's done to you. It's done for you. And God gives us the opportunity to start over. Regeneration. Phenomenal word. Justification and heirs. All that I want you to see down here is the words in the middle. By His grace. We are not justified because of our own performance. We are not made heirs because we qualified for it by doing something. We are justified and we are made heirs because it is His choice. Be gospel-centered. That's the second one. Third one, be unified by loving and serving one another. Let's look at the highlights. Uh, it'll be over two slides, but just like in the previous slide, I highlighted uh, some focus words for us. Now, especially trustworthy, insist, good works, and then good and profitable, and unprofitable and worthless, and then divisive. These are important words for us, and obviously the word avoid in verse 9. So let's look at those highlights. If you look at these highlights, ask yourself the question, do the things I spend my time on have anything to do with the gospel? Or let me ask a collective question. Do the things we spend our time on have anything to do with the gospel? That's the filter through which we should view our lives and how we steward our lives and our time. Because if it has something to do with the gospel, it will be profitable for everyone. If we keep the main thing, the main thing, which is the gospel, then we will reflect the kingdom. So, what do we spend our time on? What do we insist on? What do we devote ourselves to? And how can that be profitable for everyone? Those are questions that you should ask every single day about everything you do. Look at verse 9, avoid unprofitable and worthless and a divisive person. Let me put it to you straight. We cannot reflect the kingdom of God if we are in disunity with one another. We cannot. And we have to protect this with passion and conviction and great care. The family of God should be unified, should live unified, and should show to the world that we are unified. I don't know if you guys care about statistics about the global church. I do because I'm a pastor. At the moment, we are in massive trouble because the church is everything but unified. In our globe, we've got 33,000 distinctive denominations. We've got 485,000 different uh, officially registered types of churches. How is it possible that we can divide one Savior with one baptism, one God, one Spirit, and one church into 485,000 different pieces by nitpicking all the things that we differ on? 
Guys, we live in a world that there'll be, there's people in this world that wouldn't even listen to me this morning because I'm not tied up and I don't have the right collar. I can't even close the shirt. Hey, what's going on here? Because I'm not tied up and I'm not wearing a jacket and we sing with instruments. How? how? Well, we didn't even have instruments this morning. We sang with videos. How is it possible that we can say, well, you know what? You take your stuff and I'll take mine and we'll just leave it there. Because anyone standing out the outside would go, how is it possible that you guys can say that God has this one huge family, but you don't even get along with one another? Unfortunately, we have to, when we read a scripture like this, pay attention to this and say that we are going to do this differently. If you think about a smaller uh, unification and division, even if you just listen to someone in this church, saying something about someone else in this church, and then you say nothing, you aren't helping. We need to protect the unity we have among one another. Because it is a privilege to have brothers and sisters in Christ. Many people living in this world as Christians don't have this opportunity. Pam's story this morning was another confirmation of it. I'm telling you now that there are Christians now on this globe that wish that they could get together with other Christians. That they could have fellowship. That they could drink great coffee. And that they could just relax without having to look over their shoulders for persecution. We have it. And then we mess it up by being divisive and talking about one another and not sorting out the stuff that we have to sort out. We can't do it. This is what Paul says we have to do with one another. So I do want to encourage you, if ever there's a moment of division or suspicion among us, Let's speak up. Let's sort it out with one another. It's really as simple as, I think that you need to speak to that person. Because at the moment you guys are divided, and we can't have that, we need you to be unified again. So let's do it. And we want to protect that in our church, because that's a really easy and simple way for people to experience us together and to go, there's something different about that church. And that's what we want. Look at verse 15 quickly, and I'll land with that. Verse 15 says, All those who are with me send you greetings. And then he says, Greet those who love us in the faith. And then he wraps his whole letter with the word grace that we've said so much about. Uh, make every effort to come to me. Diligently help so that people will lack nothing. Devote yourself to good works. That's all the stuff that we ought to do with and for one another. I just want you to focus on verse 15 quickly. All those who are with me send you greetings. Who do you think Paul thought about or wrote about to Titus? When Titus received the letter and he opened it up and he read all those who are with me, who did he think of? Who do you think of? If I say this, it was a really good practice for me to go, ooh, Connie, oh, Marie, Astrid, ooh, Ben, Marita, Erika, yeah, now I remember Leon, and Sovo, Tepiso, oh, yeah, yeah, Neo, Titus, San Marie, Mulanga, Martin, wow, all of them send me greetings. And then, greet those who love us in the faith. Who are they over here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My congregation in Crete. This is who they are. Who do you think of if you read these words? I'm just asking you that question because our relationships in here matter. They do. You can't just attend whatever it is that we host, float in and float out. Because if you read a verse like this and no names pop up, then there's still some uh, relationships to be built between you and everyone in the church. How are we an agent of transformation? Be new humans, great citizens, be gospel-centered, and be unified by loving and serving one another. Let's pray that Jesus would make us this kind of church. Lord Jesus, thank you for...
this simple but great word in the Bible. Thank you that it's clear to us who we need to be. Thank you that it's clear to us who we were. And thank you that it's clear to us how big your grace is and how awesome the work that you are doing in us is. Thank you that we can be with one another and that we can experience and live out all these things. My prayer is, Lord Jesus, that we would truly transform our culture by being these new humans. That you would enable us and empower us by your Spirit to be great citizens. And that you would purify us from all these things that were part of our old nature. Disobedience and foolishness and envy and hatred and malice. Remove those things from us, Lord Jesus. So that we can live in a brand new way, all for your glory. Lord Jesus, I believe that you put us in this place for a specific reason. I believe that our presence and our lives in this place can make a huge difference in Centurion and everywhere we go every single day. May we transform culture. May we experience the joy of being regenerated and renewed by you. Help us to obey these things, not only when we want to, but always and in everything. I pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.